Welcome to another edition of Vibrant Living. My name is Daryl Dickinson, and I'm a board member of the Wenatchee Valley Senior Activity Center. I'm substituting this week for Dave Tosh, our executive director, who hopefully is uh, experiencing a little southern sun in Arizona this week. So Dave will be back again shortly. But we have a very exciting guest today that I'm very uh, happy to welcome, uh, Dr. Julie Rickard, who uh, is with us, and I'm gonna let her start by tell, telling us just a little bit about yourself, Julie, and what is it that you do? All right, so I am the founder of the Suicide Prevention Coalition, and I also run the Suicide Prevention, moment-by-moment uh, -moment suicide prevention, uh, which is doing online trainings, and then I coach and do presentations around suicide prevention. So I'm all things suicide prevention. So uh, my work with seniors has been really working with senior centers and um, working with different organizations to create pathways of care around suicide prevention. So do you work with all age groups or? Yep, I am working, I currently have a project with the schools in Wenatchee and I'm hoping to expand out to East Wenatchee and uh, into Chelan. So my, my goal is to work with any age group that has um, people that might be struggling or organizations that need training or other things around suicide prevention, Had, setting up policies and procedures and working with people that have lost someone. I do uh, debriefings after someone has passed to kind of reach out to the different groups that might be impacted by someone who's passed. Sure. So suicide is a topic that I'm sure most people don't want to talk about, yeah. but uh, tell us, give us a little bit of a sense of how big of an issue or problem is it? Yeah, so uh, when I started, it, I founded the coalition back in 2012, and uh, at that point, 32,000 people died in the United States by suicide. We're currently up to around 48,000 people. Uh, locally, the year I founded it was because we had 30 suicides that year and 11 of them were youth. And so um, predominantly that year we had a lot of youth, but we also had a lot of seniors. And since that time, I work collecting the data, trying to figure out how do we best reach out to different groups. And seniors have every year, except for this year, been on the radar as one of the highest groups. So I, what I think I'm hearing you say is that it's okay or not unnatural to be depressed on occasion, whatever age you are. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there is hope that it's treatable. Absolutely, there's hope. And I think um, depression is very treatable. And I think we just have to get in front of the people that can help us treat it. And oftentimes what happens is people that are depressed don't advocate for themselves. They also experience memory issues. So oftentimes one of the first symptoms of a depression is a lack of good memory, right? Mm -hmm. So it, you lose your memory at the beginning of depression and it doesn't return until depression's over. And so what happens is these people are like, oh, I must be getting demented or something's wrong with me. And really it's a depression where it's gone unrecognized. And so it's important to just get the questions answered, ask and push for the help that people might need outside of the other complicated medical issues that are happening. I think the other piece that's super important is asking if they're suicidal. Are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you wishing you were dead? And, or are you wishing to go to sleep and not wake up? Those are very good questions. And I think the, the fear that I hear from people is if I ask those questions, will I make it happen? And the truth is, is you won't make it happen. There's been lots of research around this. You're not implanting thoughts. What you're going to do is if someone is actually having those thoughts, it relieves them to say, oh, I can't believe you asked that and you're willing to talk to me about it. And then just having that fear answered and have someone say, you know what, it's treatable. Let's get you help. This is probably depression. And then getting them to a primary care provider or a mental health provider that can help them kind of with the next steps. And I, I think having family, having friends, or having a professional ask those direct questions, you're going to find that that person feels relieved and not angry, upset, or any anything else. You haven't created a problem. You've actually solved a problem. Great. So if someone were feeling like they might be a subject of depression and potential suicidal thoughts, uh, what would you recommend as a process? I, do you have a checklist of things that people go over uh, to help identify? Or yeah. how does that work? And who should people contact? Well, I think the, f the first thing is that if family believes or uh, someone that cares about someone is depressed or struggling with suicide, I think uh, 
asking the question directly. Once you get a positive, then it's really saying, well, who's your primary care provider? And then getting to the care, primary care provider, because if they don't have a mental health provider, the primary care will help connect them directly. The majority of um, the primary care practices in our region now um, have a mental health provider that's directly connected with the primary care. So they can see someone same day if they need to and get an assessment, get next steps already happening. Um, sleep deprivation is a big contributor. So if someone's sleep is not uh, kind of occurring regularly or at the level that they're used to, what you see is cognitive changes. And so making sure that someone knows what it is that they should be advocating for. If you know that your loved one is up and down all night and not getting good sleep, then making sure that they're getting something that will help them sleep and address that. And then seeing if we manage the sleep, does this other stuff start to improve? And I think helping us get there. I think for seniors, um, what most people don't know is there's a thing called the friendship line. And the friendship line is out of the Institute of Aging. It's a national line that was created to help seniors that maybe need someone to talk to, that feel lonely, that don't have someone checking in on them, or maybe family can't be there all the time. And so what it does is it helps families with another person that's calling and saying, hey, how, how are you? What do you need? Is there anything that you know we, we, we want to talk about today? And they will actually schedule times to talk with the people. They actually create relationships with them if that's something that the person wants. And I, I highly recommend it. And it's something that I push to a lot of my s seniors that are feeling like, you know, I'm not able to get out as much. What can I do? And now that we have a pandemic, it's a perfect time to utilize a, a line like that where they can get the extra support that can help bolster the family support as well. Great. Do you happen to know the number of that line off the top of your head? <laughs> so you're challenging me. So it's it's 800-971-0016. Great. And I assume this is all confidential? Yep. It's a, it's a warm line. So it also helps with if the person's in crisis, they will help them manage that crisis. So it's you can be suicidal and call that, and then they will also use it like a, a crisis line. But they call it a warm line, so it's actually someone that they can talk to, and then repeatedly they will work with them. Great. So how do medications fit into this scenario? So um, medications is part of the equation. So um, seniors tend, so the geriatric population tends to be more sensitive than uh, kind of the adult or youth populations to medications. So as you age, your body becomes more sensitive. So you really want someone that knows um, geriatric uh, medicine and knows psychiatry to help kind of de determine dosing. We know that medicines are helpful in terms of managing depression. Um, uh, about 86% of people will find them effective and helpful. Sometimes it takes us a while to get to the right medicine that helps the symptoms that the person's complaining of, but we can get there if they're willing to kind of trial and error with us. Or uh, sometimes if you have a family history of depression, what happens is if someone else is doing well on a medicine, oftentimes other family members will also do well on a medicine. Therapy is also very helpful. So a combination of therapy and medicine is really considered to, to be the, the prime way of treating a depression and getting them, again, more connected. Great. So once again, it is treatable. I it, think that's the answer, treatable. right? And there yeah. is help available. Yeah. And a person shouldn't be shy or embarrassed about no. asking for help or getting checked out. No, absolutely. And I think it's something that the more we can push um, that there's really no stigma. This is about whole person care. And whole person care is managing your mental and your physical health. And part of what drives actual physical problems is someone's mental health or the psychological well-being. When mm -hmm. you're not psychologically well, all of a sudden you have more headaches, you have more backaches, you have more complaints, you feel like your stomach's not digesting food right, and all of a sudden you have gastritis and you have ulcers and you have all these other things that are actually related related to the stress that you feel and the lack of relaxation and maybe the anxiety. And so when we look at all of the mental health, if we manage that first, what you find is you actually have less physical complaints. So they're all, we're, we're one person, we're all connected. Great. Uh, I had the opportunity to hear you speak recently and what I recall is that you were involved in some kind of a study or something at Mountain Meadows yeah. in Leavenworth. Can yep. you tell us a little bit about that and what you learned from that? I know that you got a little interrupted with COVID-19. Yeah. But 
So we, um, so the Suicide Prevention Coalition has different work groups. So one of the work groups was targeting seniors and developing a screener. So for two years, we put together a screener that would help um, kind of identify modifiable risk factors. And what that means is if someone uh, presents to Mountain Meadows to live, they would give them the screener and it would determine things that could go on a treatment plan over the next six months that could be changed and modified. So sometimes we have static um, things such as age. Well, we can't change age, but there are things like depression. So if we recognize someone's depressed coming in, then part of the treatment plan would be modifying and making sure that they get set up to get treated so that that improves over time. Other modifiable things are how connected are they? How many visits do they have? What are, you know, do they come out of their room for, for meals or do they stay isolated in their room? How mm -hmm. many visitors do they have? And, you know, looking at the things that the staff can help with, the families could help with, and once we identify those things, how does that change the course of someone feeling like they're isolated and wanting to die. And what we, we started, so we after two years of work, we got the chance of actually rolling out the screener. We did half of the facility and then COVID hit and we got closed down so we didn't get the other half. But what we learned was that um, the screener worked. We actually caught three people that had plans and were thinking about it. And so we were able to institute some changes to get them some help and uh, helped the, the staff at Mountain Meadows, which were really amazing at helping mm -hmm. us pilot this and then um, helping them understand more about it. But ultimately, the staff got trained in suicide prevention, so they're more able to work on things. Through COVID, one of the things that came out was that um, there really wasn't a good dementia screener for suicide prevention. And so the current one or the current standard was like an hour long process. Well, when you're already short staffed, how are you going to spend an hour just trying to figure one thing out? And so I worked on developing a screener for dementia um, that staff could kind of use as a checklist for how do they determine if someone's at high risk, low risk, moderate risk, and then how does that relate to the type of help that they need to have and the type of check-ins that someone with dementia might need if they are talking about suicide or wanting to die. And that has actually, I'm just in the process of piloting that with other senior centers and hoping that uh, senior centers are interested in buying into that and kind of helping me expand it because I think it's really needed. Great. Uh, and you reminded me one of the takeaways I had from your talk was that stands out in my mind at least is an individualized care plan is yeah. really critical. It's very critical. That it's not one size fits all. Everybody's different and you need to really zone in on the specific needs mm -hmm. of the individual. So how does a person, if they're not in an assisted living program, say they're living in the community, how could they get checked out or what do you recommend as a resource here maybe locally or your organization? Uh, what, what do you recommend in terms of uh, how people can find out if, you know, they're in trouble and or you know, <laughs> have help yeah. available? So um, anybody can go to the primary care provider. The standard of care right now is to have the patient health questionnaire at the beginning of a visit, which is a depression screener with a suicide question. That usually prompts additional kind of care plans around that. So if someone's been checked out in the last few months, what they'll find is that if they screened positive, um, then the provider should be setting up a meeting with a behaviorist to help work on kind of how do we work with you? Is medication appropriate? Is sleep an issue? Like how do we kind of wrap around this and what would be best? Now, if family's concerned, they can kind of clearly contact me or they can go to a primary care provider or a mental health provider to get help so great yeah so is there anything else that uh, you have to suggest or recommend based on your experience and kind of working with this this issue uh, with all ages but specifically seniors yeah, I think right now we're in an unusual time. And because of this uh, pandemic situation, I think one of the things that's happening is we're seeing a failure to thrive for seniors. And so seniors are not eating, not drinking, not kind of feeling like they care because they're disconnected. And so I think this is where in the beginning of the pandemic, we said, hey, check on your neighbors, right? Hey, have you seen anybody kind of coming out of their house? And I would say now's the time that we want to do that. The state just put out a couple of weeks ago that we're in what they're calling the disillusionment phase, which means that they're predicting high numbers of mental health problems because people are starting to feel depressed from just the pandemic and feeling locked in their house and feeling like they're isolated from other people. Seeing 
seniors are at a greater risk because they're even more isolated than the average population. And so because of that, it's more important to reach out. It's more important to make those calls, to not wait, to, to help them feel connected, to find ways of maybe through your tribe, keeping your tribe safe and connected. So in your circle, maybe quarantining together so that grandma can still see the grandkids and everybody knows that everybody's wearing masks and that uh, we know the highest risk group right now is in the 20 to 30 year olds that are getting together and not masking. So 90% of the population is masking and those are the people that are doing a great job. So making sure that we're masking when we're out in public and then not bringing that to our other family members. So making sure that we are doing Doing our part outside so that when we come home our people are safe and I think making sure that that will ensure that people get to stay connected and I think that will help in depression it's going to help kind of futuristically with failure to thrive and then recognizing early signs. Dr. Rickert I really appreciate you coming by today and sharing this uh, very valuable information do you have any information about how to contact you uh, or any other specific agencies that you'd like to share? Yeah, so I have a website. It's Moment by Moment Suicide Prevention. So it's www.mbmsp.net. And so it's just the acronym for Moment by Moment Suicide Prevention. Or you can contact me at my phone number. So it's 509-881-4059, which is my office number. And that will get any questions. I'm happy to answer questions for that people might have. Through the coalition, I'm a resource for other agencies or individuals that have people that are struggling or don't really know what to do or need an evaluation and aren't sure how to go about getting that. And I'm happy to, to balance any questions that families might have. 